welcome everyone. Welcome LA. Uh, very happy to be here and happy to be sharing the stage with Chris. We are going to take you through a exploration of Oregon today with some old favorites that I'm sure you're very well familiar with uh, in terms of our best known great variety and definitely what's really put us on the world stage, Pinot Noir. And we're going to explore Pinot Noir in the Willamette Valley and also in Southern Oregon's Rogue Valley. So it is our uh, most planted grape variety. So they're the four wines that you have in front of you, uh, featuring starting with the Willamette Valley first, then into Rogue Valley for comparison. We'll then jump back to the Willamette Valley to look at some exciting new wines that are coming out uh, that we're really excited about. So Gamay, Chardonnay, and our aromatic varieties. And then our final flight is the uh, flight from 9 to 12, which is Iberian varieties. So many people don't think of Oregon and Iberian varieties, but we want you to start. And I think you'll see why when we taste these wines. Uh, so with that, I'm going to let Chris yeah, so uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective and <clears throat> geography on where, where we are here, it's pretty easy because we're on the west coast. If we did this somewhere else, this might be more of an <laughs> imperative, <laughs> imperative slide, but uh, you're all pretty familiar, right? So uh, we're down here in wonderful sunny Los Angeles. We're not used to this thing in the sky, this glowing ball. Um, it's nice to experience it being down here. Um, so Oregon being sandwiched between uh, California and uh, Washington State, right? So along the Pacific Ocean. Um, and what you're gonna discover today is that the climate is totally different from uh, what we experience in Washington, where actually I'm from, um, and what you experience here in uh, California, where you're from. So in California, of course, you have a whole huge variety of climates, um, but you see a lot of them are, are coastal, right? Um, and they can be quite wild, as I'm sure, I uh, hope you've been to uh, Northern California, to like Mendocino and Sonoma. That coastline is some of the wildest coastline on the planet. Um, it's pretty incredible. Um, and to grow grapes there is a little insane, but also pretty rad too, because you get some really uh, high tone examples and whatnot. Then of course you have the influence in Napa, the San Pablo Bay, a little more of an interior climate. Um, uh, and can be a bit warmer, and then of course you get warmer as you head east. Now that, that holds true as you head up to the north as well. The further inland you go, the warmer it's going to be, but you'll see that in, um, in Oregon, a lot of these uh, growing regions are just far enough inland uh, to be a little bit protected, but they still have a major, major influence from the Pacific that we'll show you some more metrics on in a minute. Uh, whereas in Washington, you're really far interior. Okay, yeah, we have, a, we have an AVA around Puget Sound, uh, but very, very little is actually produced there. Um, there's a lot of wineries there that will truck the, uh, the grapes over, but we have most of the production happening into the east, and that's because we have major rain shadow effects here. We actually have two rain shadow effects. One, the Olympic range, which is very, very short uh, range on the Olympic Peninsula up here. And then we've got the Cascade range, um, which is a, a much longer chain, also a very high chain um, that really makes this a completely different area. So it's like high desert, whereas in Seattle, if you've ever been, it has that stigma of being rainy all the time. That's just what we tell you to keep you from moving there. Okay? Um, but uh, it really just during the winter. So it, and when you go back to Oregon, it's really unique that yes, you do have the Cascade Range here, but all the growing regions are on the west side of that versus uh, being on the east side like we have in Washington. And we do have this smaller coastal range here that Bree's gonna talk about now. Great. So when you're thinking of Oregon, the major, the major influences for our growing regions are definitely our coastal rangers and most importantly the influence of our rivers and mountain rangers. So the coast range is a fairly low-lying hill of, rain, of ranges uh, that protects our largest growing region, the Willamette Valley, from a consistent barrage of cool Pacific Ocean weather. We don't get the fog banks like uh, Napa gets or Sonoma gets. 
uh, we get a very light misting of cool ocean maritime air and just enough in the summer uh, in the afternoon that it lets through a really lovely breeze from about three o'clock onwards and allows our diurnal temperature range to shift quite significantly. Um, the Columbia Gorge region, which you can see borders uh, Washington, is based along a river system and so very heavily influenced by the Pacific Ocean winds along that river system and that valley there. And then you move into Walla Walla, which is uh, again that Blue Mountain protection area, uh, very continental, high desert climate, um, ideal for the thicker skinned um, grape varieties. As you move south, um, past Salem and into the Southern Oregon ADAs of the Umpqua Valley and Rogue River and Applegate River, uh, the mountain ranges become even more important here. This area is actually surrounded on all three sides by uh, the Coast, Cascade and Siskiyou mountain ranges and five different river valleys. So the rivers have played a really important part in carving out our vineyards here in, in Southern Oregon, and most importantly, uh, our vineyard aspects. So where our vines are able to be planted and what varieties are capable of being grown, whether they're on the alluvial river floors uh, or higher up in the uh, mountain aspects. Uh, so that gives the Southern Oregon area a real diversity of grape varieties that they can play with and again um, quite sheltered from the Pacific Ocean weather by that Siskiyou range uh, but those mountain ranges also provide a large diurnal shift and a lot of sh uh, shading in the afternoon so really uh, capable of producing high quality reds and whites, uh, long hang time and retaining the good acidity there. So if we, uh, I've got one. Thanks. I've got one. <laughs> uh, so you're probably most familiar with Willamette Valley, right? I mean, that's what Oregon's done an amazing job with is uh, identifying um, what Willamette is all about, which is largely Pinot Noir, but of course lots of other great varieties, and that's why we're excited to show you a bunch of other great things today. But uh, as she just mentioned, these other regions are pretty exciting, and uh, they're really uh, growing at a relatively fast rate, as is Willamette for that matter. But um, you know, if you look at the overall production here, yes, 72% is coming from the Willamette Valley. Um, well, Southern Oregon is a good chunk of the production as well, and it's something that is often kind of dismissed, uh, but there's a, actually a wealth of, of history there when it comes to Oregon. That's when the first vines were, were planted there, way back in the 1800s, mainly with pais that came over from uh, Europe, mainly through the Spaniards, uh, stopping over in uh, Canary Islands, picking up a little variety called Listan Negro, bringing that over to their colonies, and that made its way north, eventually all the way north to uh, Oregon, which is pretty incredible. Um, so there's a uh, rich history there. Um, you know, Willamette Valley didn't really come to be a prominent region until the 60s with uh, David Lett, uh, Dick Ponzi, uh, David Edelsheim coming after that. Uh, we'll get into that history a little bit more. Um, but you see the, uh, these others that are relatively exciting, Columbia Gorge, 2%, okay, it's teeny tiny. Well, that's because it's, uh, uh, it's a little more challenging to grow there. It's a new pioneered area. It's also sharing half of its land mass with Washington, okay, because it straddles the Columbia River. Um, Columbia Valley dips in uh, into uh, Oregon as well, and that's essentially based on the uh, footprint of basalt flows, okay? Um, so there's some uh, planting there that's really, really tiny. We'll see where that goes in the future. Walla Walla, obviously, um, really, really prominent region just for the Northwest, really. I mean, it does, it's another AVA that spans both Washington and Oregon. So it's a little confusing in that sense. Um, and there is actually a sub-AVA within that called Milton Freewater that we'll look at more specifically down the uh, down the slide deck here. Um, uh, that's entirely on the Oregon side, but uh, Walla Walla in general, whether it's Oregon or Washington, has done an amazing job uh, establishing itself as a super, super high quality growing region, and that's just continuing to grow and some really interesting, exciting things going on there. Uh, Iberian uh, varieties uh, growing there in addition to, to the south. Um, and then you have the Snake River, uh, which is uh, teeny tiny amounts. We'll see. Um, see where it goes from there. Uh, so, 
As Christina mentioned, we do have 725 producers uh, that are making wine in Oregon, and according to the TTB, uh, Oregon wine brands are cre increasing at four per month. Right. <laughs> so, um, adding to that uh, great pickup of 35% growth in, in LA. Uh, so, we also have uh, a number of vineyards, so over a thousand vineyards. So essentially, a very small producing region with small vineyard holdings is, is what we are as producers. Very small quality, um, farmer growers, producers that um, is, is really what the bench, you know, the hallmark of, of Oregon wine is. We are the fourth largest producer in, in the US and we only produce 1% of the country's wine. So, I got those stats here, actually. So, very small producers. 70% um, of Oregon wineries are less than 5,000 case production. And a lot of this is sold uh, directly within Oregon and our neighboring states. Um, What's crazy about that, if you think that, about that for a second, 70% produce less than 5,000 cases. 5,000 cases is nothing. Like that's, that's, you know, really to have a viable winery, at least in California, I was, I'm a nerdy sommelier, so I wanted to make wine in California, I wrote a little business plan. You had to make at least 3,000 cases in order to be a viable. So to think that 70% are kind of hovering in that, and granted the costs are different in Oregon and everything else, but it shows you that really this is an industry of love. Right, um, because these, this is not really people that are in it to you know make you know millions or, or even less than that. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You never go in the wine business to make millions. Okay, let's just get that straight. Um, but it really shows you that it's really just they're just passionate, super passionate people. And, uh, it, and when you tour around the region and talk to the producers, there it's just a huge community. They all work together. Um, they were just trying to figure this out, this place out, you know, um, which is pretty rad because you, you go to a lot of other regions in the world and it's not like that, okay? Um, it's very competitive. They don't talk to their neighbors. Um, it, uh, it can be very finance driven where this, yes, they're doing well, but it's this, again, they're not getting rich off this stuff. And if you look at uh, the um, uh, other neighboring states uh, that have different mentalities when it comes to that, in a lot of cases, not always, um, and you also just have a, a different approach where it is a little more finance, finance driven. You have producers that make more than the entire uh, state of Oregon makes. So one producer making more than the entire state of Oregon makes. Right, so those big producers, nothing wrong with them. There's just a different approach, you know, such as Gallo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, but it really just shows you again how much work is going into these wines. So, we are also very sustainably minded in Oregon, with 52 percent of the wines being estate made and uh, hand tended by the vineyard themselves. So that is a very practical follow through from our, our small production and um, means that basically our farmers and winemakers like to be out in the field getting their hands dirty as much as they like to be in the cellar or even less um, out on the road selling the wines, but <laughs> it's... Hardly any of them like to do that, let's be, real. <laughs> let's be realistic. <laughs> uh, so 47% of our vineyards are certified sustainable, and Oregon producers have such a mind to quality that they actually created their own live sustainable certification program uh, back in the early 80s, and we're one of the first regions to do that. Uh, now we have 35% uh, of the US's biodynamic producers in Oregon. So that's a, a very high number and we're very proud of that and it's increasing swiftly. And not to mention, as you'll learn from the from the climate and some of these areas, that's, it can be quite challenging to farm that way. So again, people that are super passionate about what they're doing. Cool, so let's see here. Uh, varieties, so we, you all are familiar with Pinot Noir, okay? Um, Pinot Noir is uh, the bulk of the plantings. What are we at now? 64%, um, which is pretty incredible. Uh, and they, it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it was a really smart move on their, on their part to identify themselves with a grape variety and create what, you know, quote unquote brand. And now, whenever you hear Oregon, you think of Pinot Noir. You can't help but think of Pinot Noir, right? And that's really awesome. However, there are, are also a lot of other amazing varieties that grow there. Um, and uh, uh, one really important one that's often overlooked is Pinot Gris. So Pinot Gris uh, was first produced in the New World in Oregon. 
Uh, it was brought by David Lett in the 60s, it was the first commercial vintage of being 1970, uh, with uh, Ponzi coming later down the road, 77, uh, Edelsheim in the, in the early 80s, um, and is really uh, also the identity of of Oregon and of Willamette Valley in particular, but all, all of Oregon, honestly. Um, and you don't really see that clear identity of a single variety outside of Pinot Noir in the US. I mean, even when you go to Napa, there's, yes, Cab, but like there's lots of other things that are growing there, right? And that came around fairly organically. You know, David, <laughs> David Lett and Charles Curry, who were UC Davis uh, expats, came, you know, essentially to Oregon in the 60s looking to plant a, a vineyard and a red variety and Pinot Noir was one of the only varieties available that was early enough ripening that would fit into this cool very marginal climate with a lot of rainfall and so it's it's sort of by accident but it's really found its place and because Pinot Noir in Oregon is the dominant uh, variety and we have so many small growers and winemakers there's no other new world wine region that i can think of that really has as much intimate knowledge of pinot noir and of site and place through a single variety um, so it's quite unique in in that direction as well uh, pinot gris still very much sec second uh, plantings for us but Normally when we say Pinot Noir, a lot of people also say, well, what about Chardonnay? And you know, you think Burgundy, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. So what happens to Chardonnay in, in Oregon? Uh, and I'm happy, very happy and excited to report that it's definitely back on the rise and on the, on the radar again. And a lot of that had to do with our original clones of Chardonnay being California clones, uh, the UC Davis clones uh, of heat-treated Wente that came up and, uh, you know, they ripened too late. We have our, our falls are very much still to this day reliant on when our rains come. And so there was a lot of wine that needed deacidification or full malolactic um, and, a, you know, with very high acids and high mallows, you get a lot of you know stuck ferments and things like that. So there, there was a lot of very bad Chardonnay in the beginning uh, from Oregon, and they they just abandoned the variety because they had such great success and they were so quality minded with their Pinot Noir that they said, if we can't do this well, we're not going to do it at all. So Pinot, so Chardonnay got pulled out in favor of Pinot Gris and replanted to Pinot, Pinot Noir also, uh, until uh, David Adelsheim in the early 80s went across to uh, Burgundy and was having conversations with uh, professors at Montpellier and um, Dijon uh, universities and uh, got them to uh, give him cuttings of Burgundy clones. And so he, brought those back the legal way, no boot, <laughs> no suitcase clones, uh, the legal David way. David did, other people. David, yeah, yeah, other people yeah. we're not so sure about. Yeah. Uh, but David brought them back the legal way so that the whole industry could have access to these clones. And they now have the moniker of the Dijon clones in, in Oregon. And this actually came about simply because the uh, lab guy in, at Oregon State University who opened the parcel uh, saw the return to sender was Dijon University. And so he just labeled them all the Dijon clones. And so they're now known as, as the Dijon clones. And they have added not only a variety that is now performing fantastically well in Oregon and in our higher altitude sites, uh, the sites that you can't plant Pinot Noir on, but they also have added great diversity to the Wente clones that were still planted in Oregon. And so we have now this fantastic diversity of Chardonnay that really adds complexity and acidity and different vibrant fruit flavors to our Chardonnays. And it's one of the most exciting varieties that, that I'm I know it's weird to say I'm excited about Chardonnay, but really it's, it's just absolutely <laughs> kicking goals in, in the Willamette Valley at the moment. So uh, yeah, keep watch for those. And we've got one to taste at, uh, in wine six. Yeah. So in addition to now having the right clones, they're also exploring the right terroirs for, for them as well. So while it, it's definitely still developing, there you know there's a lot of killer, killer Chardonnays that are on the market now that are relatively recently new to the market. 
Um, and uh, yeah, we're gonna pour one for you today at least, and you'll get to taste. Make sure you seek out the Chardonnays when you're when you're upstairs. Yeah, and then our other white varieties that obviously were planted in a cool climate by these producers, David Lett, Charles Curry, uh, when they all all arrived were uh, Alsace uh, aromatic varieties and the Willamette Valley specifically and Columbia Gorge uh, and also the Rogue Valley all still have uh, abundant plantings of aromatic varieties and the diurnal uh, temperature shifts that occur in, in these regions really add to the brightness and purity of the flavors that come out of these aromatic varieties and the high acid styles that uh, really drive the length and, and help preserve these wines uh, through the ages. Yeah, one of those for me is Riesling. I mean, I think Riesling is super exciting in, uh, I mean, I love Riesling from anywhere, really. Um, but it's super exciting in, in Oregon because you can have these, you know, being the maritime climate, uh, a lot of different wind factors that we're going to look at more specifically later. Uh, it really provides a great environment for these high acid varieties, and particularly Riesling, because it is a very hardy variety. You can throw some stress at it, right? I mean, it's from Germany. It's used to being in a frigid, frigid climate, so it can handle any kind of cooler terroir, cooler site um, in Oregon and produces really uh, linear, taut, beautiful, beautiful examples of, uh, of Riesling. So that's one that's exciting for me. Um, beyond that, I think there's some great Gewürztraminer that's being planted, another uh, Alsace variety. Um, and, uh, you know, I, for me, a long time, I, it took a long time for me to come around to Gewürztraminer. I had to go to Alsace to, like, for it to click, you know. Uh, but it's all about putting in the right with it with the right food and also uh, picking it before it loses all its acid. And, and Oregon can do that. It has the right sites to preserve that acid. Uh, and so you get very focused, very beautiful examples that are not overbearing in the kind of monoterpene floral type uh, style and characteristic and or without a ton of residual sugar. Okay, not that I don't mind some residual sugar, but you need the acid to balance it out, right? Absolutely. Okay. And so Gewurztraminer and then Austrian varieties are also starting to take off as yeah. well. So Grüneveltliner is, is especially in the South Salem Hills in the Old Amity area. And in the gorge. And in the gorge. Yeah. Uh, and the Umpqua Valley is, is actually really starting to show a lot of promise. Um, the UV levels that we get help to ripen those quite thick uh, uh, Gruner Veltliner skins. And so that's really where a lot of the flavor profile comes from in Gruner. And we're able to get that UV penetration and long hang time as well, uh, combined with the extended acidity in those wines. It just makes for a perfect growing season and growing recipe. And that luminosity them. factor is the same with Riesling too, because mm -hmm. Riesling has thicker skins and it really benefits from that, from that light exposure or luminosity, uh, which we have spades of yeah. Yeah, in the north. Cool. And then the last bracket you'll see when we talk about the Iberian varieties, they don't even register on the, on the Oregon State Census, great census yet, but the Iberian varieties, Menthea, Ganacha, Tempranillo, uh, we have all of the Duro varieties. There's a lot of exciting things happening and our producers are get, just getting more and more excited by uh, what they can uh, plant and what they can find and what's coming into the country now. So Gadeo is being planted in the Willamette Valley. Gadeo is being planted in the Gorge. Albarino is, is, seems to be popping up everywhere. Uh, so again- Or is already well established in certain- In certain, certain in Umqua, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we'll jump through into labeling regulations. Yeah, well, let's look at these real quick. So just some nerdy info for you, just so that you know what uh, is required by the TTB versus by the state, right? So it's much more lax on a federal level. Uh, so when you have the TTB, um, you have 75% has to be declared from uh, the county, uh, country, state, or county, right? So it's pretty lax. Uh, and uh, with Oregon, it's 100% that needs to come um, from from Oregon itself, and that was really the, these producers uh, that banded together and said, "Hey, we want to focus on quality. We're all relatively small. Um, we are going to make wines at the highest level. We don't want there to be an opportunity for other stuff to be blended in to dilute the kind of the mission that we want to uh, to do here." Um, and then, if you look at uh, for the um, AVA, it's 85%, which falls in line with EU regulations, but with Oregon, it's 95%. And really what this relates to is maintaining the identity uh, for, in a lot of cases, for Pinot Noir um, in the Lament especially. 
And so the varietal declaration is also, again, aimed at that high quality level, high consistent quality levels and premium uh, product from our producers, where the federal regulation is uh, the 75% rule must be on the variety with 25% of other varieties blended in. Whereas in uh, Oregon, the named variety uh, must be uh, 95, sorry, 90% and then 10% of other varieties is permitted. Um, there are 18 varieties that are excluded from that regulation in Oregon, and they're primarily the Bordeaux varieties and Rhone varieties that would typically be blended together. Uh, and this is to accommodate our Eastern and Southern Oregon producers. So again, you know, just having that dedication and that foresight to say on a producer level and have agreement, get consensus in the 80s uh, and 90s when these rules were brought into place that we are really quality minded and focused and this is what we are truly about and there is no compromising and, and the, the producers are very much still the same today. All right, so to look at um Overall temperature, this is not of a particular region. Actually, we have some examples of the various regions and how they fall into uh, these average temperature kind of windows. And this is all based on the Winkler scale, which we can debate about its validity for a while. But it gives you some general idea of what these uh, regions fall into. And you, fall, you see that they fall into almost entirely you know, cool to moderate climates, with the exception of Walla Walla, OK, is a warm climate. And that's because it's so far inland so interior that you have uh, much warmer average temperatures during the growing season, but they are paired with that huge diurnal shift that we see not only there in other regions as well, uh, but you're looking at like 40, you know, 50 degree swings, that's huge. Uh, imagine trying to pack for that, right? You're, you bring every, your entire wardrobe <laughs> because in the morning you're freezing your ass off and then by noon you're sweating your ass off, okay? So uh, if we look at Columbia Gorge and Willamette Valley, those fall into, um, into the cool climates. Um, and uh, we'll look at kind of how the precipitation and the heat comes, because that really helps carve out these areas to, uh, to fall into the categories they do. Um, and then uh, Southern Oregon falling into the intermediate because, uh, because of its southerly latitude, because of its protection from all those mountain ranges that Bria mentioned earlier, and we'll look at those with more specificity shortly. So uh, this is, is a quick temperature graph to give you an idea of the differences uh, between California, Oregon, and uh, Washington areas. So, you know, cooler means, uh, or blue means cooler, essentially. So you see in California, it gets a, it's a bit warmer, especially when you head inland. Um, and you would think you would see that in Washington, et cetera, or Eastern Oregon, but it's because of that crazy diurnal shift that it, it brings the, uh, the average is down. And then the, one of the final uh, very important factors is our latitude in Oregon. So we are uh, quite a bit farther no north than the Northern California growing areas. And in the summer, our daylight hours uh, in the growing season is 15 plus hours. So on average, about 16 hours uh, for our grapes to soak up all of that sun and light and uh, it really makes a difference uh, to the, the luminosity and the, the ripeness and extended growing season, making all of these unique varietals very possible in, in our growing regions. Yeah, the light really helps to develop the ripeness in the skins, right? Um, that's where most of the flavor is, right? Uh, the sugar, there's phenolic ripeness and there's sugar ripeness. Uh, you need sugar to make alcohol, okay, to make wine. Uh, however, really all the good stuff is in, in the skins um, where you're, you're looking for that phenolic development and that's usually the challenge is to develop that phenolic character before the sugar gets too high and before you get so much alcohol you're like, oh, I gotta pick this, right? But otherwise it's gonna be like a, a shot of whiskey, uh, but you don't quite have that, that phenolic development. So with that extra luminosity, but cooler temperatures, you have light exposure without the excessive heat. So it slows down the sugar ripening and accelerates the phenolic ripening. And by now you're probably getting thirsty and wondering when you're going to be able to put these delicious wines in your mouth. So <laughs> that time is now. Uh, we're going to introduce the Willamette Valley where the first three wines are from. And they're Pinot Noirs, 
we're going to very quickly jump into uh, Southern Oregon, uh, but we wanted you to taste the four Pinot Noirs next to each other uh, in, in this lineup. And we're looking at primarily soil differences. So each of these three uh, wines are from the nested AVAs, uh, which were created in 2005. Um, and yep, so the, the northern Willamette Valley is where these uh, wines come from and, and from the six primary AVAs up there at the moment. Uh, there are more on the way, but for now we've just got these six. Uh, and you have in front of you Ribbon Ridge, Dundee Hills, and Eola Amity Hills. So the Willamette Valley was established first in 1983. It's a huge region. It's 3.3 million acres. Um, and of that, there are only about 21,000 acres, 22,000 acres planted currently. Uh, to give you an idea, Sonoma County covers 1 million acres and 60,000 acres of Sonoma County is planted. Uh, Sonoma County also has 1,800 grape growers, uh, so generally triple the, almost triple the plantings of, of the Willamette Valley. So that gives you some perspective and Chris is going to introduce you a little bit deeper to what influences these styles of wines. Yeah, so you, you have a, this kind of interesting graph here, graph here of uh, precipitation and temperature, right? Uh, so the blue bars are precipitation and, um, uh, and uh, temperature on the right, okay? So you have, um, you see that the precipitation really falls uh, more in the, uh, sorry, the in temperature the is the, the, red, the red line, excuse me. So you have the blue bars being in precipitation, you see that it falls in the winter time. Right, so that's really, really advantageous because one of the biggest uh, challenges with grape growing is is moisture management. Right, is is uh, uh, dealing with rot and all those kinds of issues that come with that. So, uh, but you still need water for successful viticulture. So it's really beneficial that it falls all in the winter, which it does here, even though you're in a maritime climate. Um, and you see the temperatures really top out uh, at you know almost 90 degrees. This is a little. It depends on the vintage. It's the average. It's the average, right. It's the so average. So there are definitely days that climb above 100 degrees, right? Um, but those days are few. Um, so you have a relatively cooler area and you have a uh, also dry area, which is super beneficial. So it's, e it's not easy, but it makes it possible to make uh, really high quality wine here as, uh, as a result. So these are from McMinnville, which is one of those nested AVAs. Um, that's tucked kind of right behind the coastal range, very close to the Van Duzer Corridor as well. Um, so that Van Duzer Corridor, which is a big inlet for wind that we'll look at in a moment, has the ability to kind of keep things cooler too. So that's super advantageous. Something that is also important, noting those uh, temperature and precipitation, uh, with the precipitation falling in the winter, we really rely on that winter rainfall because the majority of our vineyards are dry grown. So our vineyards are relying on the stored water that's held in the earth uh, during the winter. So we don't have any uh, mountain ranges that, that collect snow and so we don't rely on snow melt, we rely on ground um, soaking winter water. Uh, that also affects uh, our bud break and the end of our season as well. So depending on when those spring rains end, which um, for this Australian could have been um, a little earlier this year, um, <laughs> it, was, it was still 50 degrees and pouring rain last week. So um, it's nice to be down here in the sunshine. But what that means for our producers is that vintage variation is very, very real. They are already you know, cutting off their sales trips so that they can be monitoring the bud break in the vineyard, um, making sure that the canopy is you know, going to be set properly and, and all the pruning that, that's taking place now. Uh, so something to keep in mind is that Oregon is incredibly different, the Willamette Valley especially, uh, to other New World growing regions because, our, because of our vintage variation. And each year, we never know exactly when those uh, winter rainfalls are going to come. Sometimes they start coming in the middle of September, and sometimes it's the end of October. And if we've had a late bud break, like we're having this year, or a more normal bud break, uh, then we're really hoping that we're getting an extended you know, Indian summer to get those grapes 
nice and ripe uh, and picking in the middle of September instead of you know picking under pressure of, of poor weather. So it's it's a very exciting place to be and and a lot to pay attention to in terms of Oregon wine. All right, so uh, moving on to uh, kind of talk about day length already. Uh, the winds, so you have a, a number of really important wind factors here. Uh, so you have obviously a lot of influence from the Pacific Ocean, right? So you have this smaller, uh, lower elevation coastal range that provides some protection from that, but you're pretty darn close to the ocean. You're anywhere from, what is it, 35 40 to miles, 40, yeah, 40, 40, to 60 miles. 40 to 60 miles, depending on where you are in the valley. So you are really close and you still are feeling that uh, impression for them from the Pacific and being a mountain range that's not super uniform right you have breaks in that mountain range uh, and uh, one of the, the biggest most exciting ones to me is the Van Duzer uh, which Brie will point out here yep so this comes out just south of McMinnville uh, kind of uh, almost in the blast radius uh, Eola Amity Hills is pretty much in the blast radius of it, a good chunk of it and they're actually looking at making an AVA that is the Van Duzer Corridor AVA because it is so significantly different there um, and those winds uh, really cool things down but they also provide an opportunity to dry the vineyard out right if you have any kind of rain event. Um, so a lot of these uh, tighter bunch varieties and or varieties that like cooler, um, more harsher, windy environments uh, are, are really, really thriving here. And you're gonna taste uh, a couple wines from there today, uh, but really watch this area. It, there's gonna be some really neat stuff coming out of here. Um, all the other breezes are, uh, they hit that coastal range and they're relatively, um, either come up the uh, Columbia River Gorge or uh, Columbia River Valley because you have this massive river that creates this wind tunnel essentially so that really affects the the columbia gorge ava but all the other northern the nested northern willamette avas are kind of relatively protected from that coastal range um, so you have uh you have not a uh, you have a wind shadow if you will yeah um yeah so uh you really see a lot of variation within the climates because of these wind influences it's pretty fascinating yeah and the three pinot noirs that you have in front of you are, are there's definitely two in here that are heavily uh wind influenced uh number one being sitting at the very top of the ribbon ridge uh, ABA and gets the very cool winds coming over uh, the top of the coast range there. And then number three sitting in the Eola Amity Hills, I think you can see the color differentiation and the smallness of the berries or the concentration of the berries and the thicker tannin profile um, that comes in that color in, in wine three is, is a direct influence of those cool Van Duzer corridor winds that really moderate that climate. Uh, and make a very um, different style of wine from there. So thicker skinned, um, smaller juice to skin ratio. So uh, yeah, smaller yeah, lower, juice to skin lower, or higher, higher, uh, higher skin, skin to, to must, yeah. uh, whatever you want to look at it. But because of that wind influence, you're getting smaller berries, right? Changes the physiological nature of the grape variety itself. So when you increase that uh, skin to must ratio or vice versa, uh, uh, you make very, very different styles of Pinot Noir. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so moving on from there, soils are um, really fascinating uh, and fairly complex. Um, you really have three major soil types, okay? So you've got marine sedimentary, uh, you've got uh, volcanic, and then you've got this windblown lus, all right? So essentially, uh, these were formed during different stages of geographical uh, history, uh, geological history, excuse me. Uh, but essentially what happened was you had two major plates that collided, okay? You had the uh, 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 Juan de Fuca plate that was underneath the Pacific Ocean, collided with the North American plate, uh, and lucky for all of us on the West Coast, <laughs> uh, the North American plate won and was uh, elevated and the, the Juan de Fuca plate uh, subducted, went underneath, right? Um, so with all that collision, you had a lot of volcanic activity as a result that uh, formed the Cascade chain uh, and uh, a lot of, um, uh, eruption. I mean, Mount St. Helens erupted in uh, most recently 1980 90, yeah. or 82. I can't remember. 80, I think. Um, you know, so it, as far as uh, geological history, that's a blink of an eye. Okay, that's a long time ago now. That's that's when I was born. So it's a long time ago. Um, 
but you know, really that's relatively recent. And so that really has carved the landscape and established a lot of uh, how some of the AVAs have been established. So you look at the Columbia Valley, Valley AVA, for instance, that was based on all those basalt flows from that volcanic activity that was about 15 million years ago. Okay? So the collision uh, created that volcanic activity. It also, uh, because of that collision, brought up a lot of seafloor, uh, the part of the North American plate that was lower in elevation and then got pushed up from that Juan de Fuca plate. So now you have exposed marine sedimentary, right? And that, guy, that can either be fairly uniform or can be all jumbled with other types of uh, like volcanic or lust or something like that, okay? So those are the two major ones. And you also have a major factor in the Lamb Valley of this windblown lust, okay? It's not low S, it's lust. Uh, it's a little confusing. And it's essentially degraded uh, basalt, all right? So volcanic material. And uh, that is, uh, can be um, like really fine pebbles or really fine dust, like almost like a, like a talcum powder, okay? If you've driven or walked through a, a vineyard that's, that's based on lust, you know it because you can't get rid of this stuff, okay? Um, it's on your shoes forever, it's on your car, you wash your car, you still find it in the crevices everywhere, okay? But it's low in nutrients, it's well draining, it's everything that high uh, quality viticulture uh, likes. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are the three major soil types here. You also have a little bit of Missoula flood material as well. Um, there's not a ton of plantings on that, but those were a series of cataclysmic uh, floods about 15,000 years ago, uh, where you had this really large glacier um, to the north and east, and uh, that was melting and receding, and that melted water pooled, created this huge mass of water, and so massive that it, it was able to lift that glacier, essentially float the glacier, and all this water came through um, and massive amounts of water came through at really high velocity. It was essentially like a, a land uh, tidal wave, okay? Um, and it was very violent and brought a lot of material that uh, was deposited elsewhere, including in the Willamette Valley and other parts of Oregon, as well as carved the landscape kind of like sandpaper wood, okay? Um, and that, that series of events happened uh, many, many, many times, okay? Um, so they topped out essentially at about 1,200 feet is where those floods topped out. So you will see some of that uh, here and there, but these are the major soil types. Yes, yeah, so as Chris said, primarily the two major soil types in the Willamette Valley are the, the basalts, the volcanic basalts, uh, two main series that you're going to taste in your glass today in wines two and three. Uh, you have the Jory soil series in uh, wine two, which is the Dundee Hills. So the three main ABAs that are based around the volcanic soil series are the Dundee Hills. We all know the phrase, the red hill of Dundee's. So um, quite oxidized red uh, volcanic soil series. Uh, all of these basalts are lava flows that have hardened uh, as they've been exposed to the oxygen. So they have quite a bit of um, fissures in them that allows the water during the uh, wet season to soak up and be made available to the vine roots during the growing season. So very beneficial during our dry, dry summers. Uh, so the Dundee Hills AVA is in the north, in the just south of the Shehalem uh, AVA, and it's sheltered by that Shehalem Hills series there. So it's one of the warmer AVAs, and uh, if you taste this wine, the the wine too, um, it has a very distinctive Dundee Hills palette, which is the um, spicy, silky red fruit, very bright red fruited um, with high toned spice to it. Volcanic soils, as we know from tasting uh, throughout Italy and parts of Spain, is that the wines from volcanic soils tend to be much brighter and red fruited in nature. Uh, and so I think you'll find that in the, these two wines in front of you. Um, wine three is from the Nakaya series of of soil, uh, volcanic soil in the Eola Amity Hills. And so again, combining that distinctive climatic aspect of the Eola Amity Hills um, with the, so the Eola Amity Hills down here with um, the Van Dusa Corridor winds that come through, uh, which also hit the McMinnville ABA, which is the other volcanic primarily volcanic ABA in the Willamette Valley. So the three, Dundee, McMinnville, and Eola Hills, and then parts of Shehala Mountain. So this area here is known as Parrot Mountain, and these are primarily volcanic soils there. 
Uh, but no parents, unfortunately. No parents. Yeah. <laughs> I was really disappointed. <laughs> and then the first wine, which we should definitely taste, is uh, the Sedimentary Soils. So Willa Kenzie Soil Series. And this is from the Ribbon Ridge AVA. So the three major um, sedimentary soil AVAs are the Shehalem Mountains, the Ribbon Ridge, which sits entirely within the Shehalem Mountains, and the Yamhill Carlton AVA. So Ribbon Ridge was created uh, just after the Shehalem Mountains AVA was created. And it was created because this is an uplifted piece of the valley floor that is uniquely different to the rest of the Shehalem Mountains. So very well draining, Willikensee soils. It gives fuller bodied wines because the soil is so free draining, um, but very high toned and pretty and spicy as well. A lot of pomegranate and ruby red grapefruit and spice notes in these wines. And this wine in particular in wine one is the uh, Goodfellow Heritage number no. four. Uh, from Ribbon Ridge and it's a mixed clonal vineyard planting. The vineyard is actually sits right above uh, Beaufrere's Ribbon Ridge vineyard so it's it's cresting the top of the hill and um, Patricia and Richard the the growers and farmers who planted this 22 years ago um, are always you know having having a go at uh, Mike Etzel about about the the notoriety that Beaufrere gets and they're situated right next door and on top but the special thing about this wine is that Patricia is actually responsible for planting this vineyard and she planted a Masal selection so when they were planting it um, they didn't have a lot of uh, clonal material to choose from and they also didn't have a lot of rootstocks to choose from. So this vineyard is planted, some of the vi vines are own rooted in the soil and a couple of them have phylloxera. The rest of them are planted onto four different uh, types of rootstock and they're primarily um, Pomard and Vadensville with some Dijon clonal material in there as well. But they've just been re replanted as um, Patricia has had the time to be able to omega graft her own vines and get them into the soil. Um, so this vineyard is, is very diverse and, and very bright and it gets hit by that nice cool uh, wind coming over the top of the hill. Um, Marcus handles the fruit uh, very gently in the cellar. It's all um, hand plunged. It's about 75% whole cluster as well and it stays in oak barrel um, in generally older oak barrels I believe this is a third new and it uh, stays in those barrels for between 14 to 18 months so very very slow wild fermentation natural malolactic it just hangs out and takes its time in the cellar to come together and Marcus doesn't rush it he, he's kind of the slow food of, of wine approach to uh, winemaking you really taste it in the wine. You can taste this cool sight, right? It's really uh, has elevated acidity. Um, it's really perfumed, elegant. Um, I like this wine a lot. And it's interesting to taste it next to the others where you really see uh, Dundee come out, right? Number, wine number two is all about texture, right? There's this kind of like silken texture. It's a little bit, definitely a little bit riper um, than wine one and wine three for that matter, okay? You see it, you, know, you see it in the, in the alcohol percentages, but you also feel it, right? Wine two is all about that silken texture. And then wine three is about structure, right? It's got tannin, like a considerable more tannin than the other two. And it's also not only in the color, but in the flavor profile, the, str the fruit is much, much darker, right? And you're really feeling the influence of the, that Van Duzer wind hitting uh, the Eola Amity Hills. Um, and also soil too. But mainly, it's, uh, for me, it's that the major impact is the wind, okay? So that one is made uh, by uh, Thomas Sav and uh, Larry, um, Larry Stone, who's a master sommelier, is kind of an icon in the, in the Northwest, icon in the Somme world period. Um, but this is his winery, which is right next to uh, Seven Springs, and, uh, which is a famous, famous site in, in the Olamide Hills. Um, and he's planted right next door, and the wines are really exciting, not just Pinot Noir, but also Chardonnay as well. Um, so hopefully, will they get to taste those up there? 
Uh, oh, I'm not sure. You can, you can taste them at some point. They're really, really good. Is the, is seek the, them out. Yeah, <laughs> seek them out, exactly. Uh, so taste them again side by side, one, you know, quickly one after the other, and you really get a sense for the AVAs here. So yeah. really classic examples. Yeah, and wine too is Knudsen Vineyard, which was planted in the 70s right next to Dickie Rath's uh, vineyard in the Dundee Hills. And uh, Cal Knudsen farmed this vineyard uh, you know, up until his dying day and really loved this place. And uh, his, his um, siblings come back to continue to farm and take care of it. Um, and the vineyard traditionally um, went to they were just growers. They didn't make their own wines until recently, and the fruit all went to Argyle. So, um, you know, very good relationships in in this valley. All right. So moving on, we've got uh, some pictures for you here, just so you can get a sense if you've never been. Right. So here we have the Shehalen Mountains. So this is uh, far north, uh, much closer to Portland. Okay, so it's the the most northerly uh, nested AVA within the Willamette Valley, and you see the elevation advantages here in the Shehalen Mountains. Right. Yep. Stunning. This is that Elk Cove? Um, Ridgecrest is a vineyard within the Ribbon Ridge AVA, so within the Shehalem Mountains AVA as well. So you can see just rolling hills, uh, not particularly steep at this point. And then in the next vineyard, um, Montazi Vineyard, so this is biodynamically farmed vineyard, uh, in the McMinnville AVA. And McMinnville has uh, notoriously thin topsoils, and you can see that in, in this image here um, of very thin volcanic topsoils in this AVA, and the vines really struggle here. And you can also see how it's really tucked into uh, the foothills here. So the McMinnville AVA is really far uh, situated, situated excuse me, far west. Um, just north of the Van Duzer Corridor and really tucked into those mountains. So you actually have a big variation of character from the north to the south because the south is heavily influenced by that Van Duzer wind. And then Mount Richmond is in Yamhill Carlton, which is um, a donut shaped uh, or horseshoe shaped AVA, which is um, quite protected by the Coast Range. Um, and then the final slide is Evening Land in the Ola Amity Hills. But I think what you really see from these images is just how green and lush and uh, that the Willamette Valley is not a monoculture. It is not just the vine. Uh, there are orchards, uh, hazelnuts, grass seed is a huge um, operation for trees. Um, so it's really a diverse region. Yeah, hazelnuts. Some of the best pork you'll ever taste in your life called Tails and Trotters. Oh my God. It's like pig jello. It's delicious. The fat part. Sounds gross. Does taste it. Okay? Delicious. Okay. Uh, and then, um, so the, the third wine, uh, Lingua Franca, uh, is literally right next door. So it's just out of the frame here. I, think, I forget if it's here or here, but it's yeah, just it's literally right. right, right, right next door. And then so the fourth wine, which I w we wanted you to taste with those other Pinot Noirs, but be aware that it's in Southern Oregon. So taste the fourth wine, Irvine and Roberts, which is from the Rogue Valley AVA in Southern Oregon. And while you're tasting the four as a series, I'll uh, quickly run you through the Southern Oregon uh, AVA. So this is the second largest growing region. Southern Oregon as an AVA is the second largest growing region in Oregon. It accounts for about 22% of the state's total, which um, Chris talked about earlier. Um, and it's about two and a half million acres with only 6,600 planted. Uh, again, the major soil types here are marine sediments, except you now come into um, alluvial gravels and volcanic basalts as well. Uh, again, this is very much heavily influenced by the uh, mountain ranges and the five river systems down in this ABA. Main varieties range from Pinot Noir being the most uh, planted through to a lot of Bordeaux varieties and now the Iberian varieties as well. So the main major factors here, again, we get most of the rainfall in the growing season and very warm summer, so warmer than the Willamette Valley. But again, the aspects of slope and the altitude of AVAs and the river influence. So the cooling, moving, flowing aspect of the air and wind through the river systems um, is very important in this AVA for keeping um, a nice long growing season um, for, these, for these varieties and developing flavor um, content. 
uh, marine sedimentary bedrock. Chris has already been over how all of this is created, so I'm just repeating myself if I, if I go through this. Um, be aware that the major volcanic soils in southern Oregon are not um, as much basalt influenced as the Willamette Valley is. It's more uh, volcanic basalts that are, um, sorry, granites that have been formed by lava under the earth. So alluvial granites and the shifting of the river systems have eroded these volcanic soils down to the granites and alluvial soils and that's the main um, soil types around these river systems. So free draining, they warm up early which is great because they do tend to get a longer season here um, and very free draining. The Rogue Valley AVA itself is about 56, sorry, is about 3,800 acres planted. And the wine that you've got in front of you is planted, uh, is planted on sandstone um, and loam clay sediments. So very important for the vine roots here to grow deep. This is primarily triple uh, seven and one one five in your glass. They pick in about mid September in in the Rogue Valley. Um, so down in this area, it is located right around Ashland, just here. And this is actually a really special vineyard. It's actually where the confluence of uh, three mountain ranges happen. So it's almost on the California border and the Siskiyou, Cascades and Coast Ranges all come together at the end of this valley. It's a very beautiful, beautiful valley. Um, and the, their vineyard just across the street is planted on basalt. So it's, it's still a very diverse growing, uh, growing area um, that we're just getting to know a little more intimately down here now as producers increase in this area. So the main regions that are um, growing in Oregon are the Southern Valleys, Southern Oregon AVAs and also the Willamette Valley and the Columbia Gorge. Uh, so this uh, wine in front of you, the Irvine Roberts, is 2015 also. So again, warm growing season, uh, de-stemmed de and uh, pump overs gently, gently pressed, uh, and then a longer uh, time in French oak barrels, so slightly longer in French oak barrels, but I think you see in the profile of that wine a little bit richer fruit component that can handle that slightly um, heavier oak toast as well. Awesome. Should we taste some more wine? Yeah, let's okay. jump back to the Willamette. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we're just going to dive into some uh, other varieties that maybe you're not as familiar with. So that is the second flight. Uh, so starting with wine uh, five, uh, on the left-hand side there, the red wine in the flight. Yes, question. Some of us are missing the Chardonnay. Okay, we'll give that to you. Uh, we'll give us some more Chardonnay. Chardonnay. Can front. you just put your hand up if you're missing the Chardonnay? Ooh, that person's fired. <laughs> <laughs> Who already drank their Chardonnay? Chardonnay? Just want some more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay as well. <laughs> totally, yeah. we've got plenty. Okay, so um, uh, we want to pour you some gamut. Okay, um, as all nerdy sommeliers and wine folk, you probably like Gamay. Hopefully you do, okay? Um, now, while this isn't Beaujolais, uh, it is delicious Gamay, all right? This is made by uh, Doug Tunnell at Brick House. So he's located in the Ribbon Ridge, uh, Nested AVA. He was a, a foreign correspondent for CBS for many, many moons. Uh, so he lived in Europe, uh, lived in London, among Beirut. many other Beirut, <laughs> all sorts of crazy places. Um, he, uh, and so during this time he was exposed to wine and came to really love wine and in particular, uh, Pinot Noir and, uh, Gamay. And so when he, uh, moved back to the U.S. and retired from CBS, he bought this property in roughly 1990 or so, um, in the Ribbon Ridge AVA and planted Pinot Noir and Gamay, the wines that he loves. And, um, so he was one of the pioneers for the variety and, uh, you know, he's just, you know, he, of course, has the voice. He's a correspondent, right? So he's got this really deep, beautiful voice, and he's a big, tall teddy bear. And, and uh, he farms everything biodynamically. He does the uh, majority of the work himself. Um, and he's constantly experimenting with different clones. He's 
in the process of planning more Gamay and Pinot Noir on his site with newer, uh, not newer, but different clone, clonal uh, selections. And um, for me, it's vintage after vintage, uh, one of the best examples of Gamay in the state. But there's actually a lot of other people making Gamay these days. Yeah, How many a, did you say now? Nearly 40, 40 producers okay. that make Gamay in the Willamette Valley. And uh, I, think, I think you see why in this glass it has an affinity for, you know, to the Pinot Noir style. But with our uh, warmer summers that we've had in the last three vintages, four vintages, four. Um, you know, Gamay actually is getting very nice ripeness and it actually retains its acidity a bit better than Pinot Noir does, especially on our um, low pH soils, which generally tra translate into higher, higher pH, pH wines. Yeah. So Gamay is performing really well and a lot of producers are excited about it, especially the younger producers who uh, you know, have, have geeked out on, on Gamay and Beaujolais like the, like the rest of us. So we wanted to show that as, as Doug being the, I don't know if David led his Papa Pino, Doug might be <laughs> Grandpa Grenache? <Yeah. laughs> Gamay? Gamay? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, kill me. Uh, yeah, I don't like know if that. you would like that. <laughs> Um, but he's also playing around with new clones of Gamay as well, so higher quality clones, the crew clones that come from um, Beaujolais as well, and these are what are being planted in some of the new plantings in the Willamette Valley as well. Yeah, another great example from older vine plantings is, uh, is uh, Seven Springs Vineyard has some old Gamay, uh, but it's now had phylloxera, so it won't be around for much longer, but if you get the chance to check that out, it's another yeah. great example too. <laughs> And then moving into the white varieties, so we've got two from the Willamette Valley and one from the Rogue Valley. The first one in your glass, uh, yes, you're, you're not seeing things, it is a little hazy, it's an unfined and unfiltered wine, um, Chardonnay, and it's made from uh, Chardonnay, Wente clone, Espaguette, uh, and a variety of other clones from the Johan Vineyard. Uh, which sits uh, right in the brunt of the Van Duzer Corridor. It's a biodynamically farmed vineyard uh, just outside the Eola Amity Hills AVA. Uh, and this vineyard actually has more than 28 different, um, different plantings of various varieties. Grunewald, Lina, Blau Franc, Trousseau, uh, Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Franc. Uh, they're playing around with, with a lot of different things. Uh, and this wine actually was just judged um, best Oregon white wine and best Chardonnay at the at Texom International Wine Awards. So we felt it was uh, worthy of being in the lineup. Um, and considering that it's a, a more minimal intervention style of Chardonnay, so whole cluster press, um, very slow pressing, so lots of skin time, and then a wild fermentation in barrel and uh, naturally occurring malolactic fermentation as well. Um, it's very complex and it just continues to open up in the glass and I think this shows you some of the potential of what Chardonnay can do. But there's so many different sites and aspects of Chardonnay that's coming out of the Ola Amity Hills, the Shehala Mountains, where those original Dijon plantings are, um, that really retain that bright acidity uh, and have a lot of flavor to them. So mm -hmm. Chardonnay is definitely one to watch going forward in the Willamette. This is a good example of kind of the, um, the kind of not new school, but definitely a different approach to uh, making Chardonnay and not just in Oregon, but around the world. So that slower press uh, with a fair amount of skin contact is what a lot of people are experimenting with to build more structure and phenolic density in the wines. Um, so we actually both worked at Harvest in Australia with Mac Forbes and he's making it this way. And I've, so he was the first one to expose it to me and then I've been researching it elsewhere. And, and that's kind of like the new deal. So in larger format, oak. Full um, solids to barrel. Full solids, yeah. So this is a great example of kind of the new, quote unquote, you know, new school way to make Chardonnay. Um, rather than doing a faster whole cluster press and, and more of a kind of crisp, clean, clear, this is richer, rounder, uh, and I, you know, arguably a little more complex in certain ways. I'm not saying the other way is bad, just saying it's a different way to make Chardonnay. What was your question back? That was Lenticon. What's that? It was Lenticon. Sure. Primar primarily Wente, yes, Un unheat treated Wente. So the um, known as Mendoza clone in Australia, it gets um, hen and chicken bunches. So you have, a, again, a higher um, skin to juice ratio 
it got phased out um, by heat treating in the in UC Davis, and because it was unreliable for yields because of the looser clusters and those hen and chicken clusters. So. Um, Wente clone that's heat treated uh, is is primarily in there's, it's in a lot of vineyards in California and other yeah. areas, and, but and unfortunately, I don't know. People may have different opinions. My opinion is not as high quality as that old school Wente clone. Personally, it makes excessively beige wines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> beige. Well, that was definitely not a compliment. Okay, <laughs> all right. Cool, let's move on. Um, so the next wine is Riesling from Petra. So this is a young winemaker who worked in the Mosul Valley and in the Falz also. And yeah, so he's in the Eola Amity Hills in one of the old vine vineyards uh, in the Eola Hills. So volcanic soils and also um, he's, he's carved out a piece of sedimentary um, soil that can be found in Eola Amity as well uh, and, and has just found his place here. And he makes uh, four different types of Riesling in various um, residual sugar levels. Man, you can really feel the false influence. Like, if I was blind tasting that, I'd be like, wow, it's, it's peachy, but still has lots of acid. It's very much that false kind of style. So faults being uh, further south in Germany, or in the border of Alsace, not too far away. So it's definitely a warmer, one of the warmest regions within Germany, producing more peachy styles, just like that. It's pretty amazing how uh, sim how many similarities there are. Yeah, and the, the you know the dynamic uh, nature of the soils in the faults as well. I yeah, think really sure. align with with the Eola Amity Hills as well. And Riesling is such an underrated variety. We know that in in the psalm world and in the trade, um, but. Oregon has some of the oldest vine Rieslings and they just absolutely shine. And um, yeah, stellar examples like this exist all over the Willamette Valley, so that's exciting. And then finally, we're going back to the Rogue Valley in the uh, final white wine, which is a Gewurztraminer. Sorry, yes, one question. We are missing the Gewurztraminer. Uh, uh, Gewurztraminer, please, can you put your hands up if you're missing the Gewurztraminer or just want to drink some more? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this Gewurztraminer is actually from the Rogue Valley, but from a valley that's closest to the ocean uh, in southern Oregon called the Illinois Valley. And this Gewurztraminer is quite old. It's planted in 1976, so almost as old as the Willamette Valley. And um, it just, you know, is so typical of a very graceful, elegant Gewurztraminer with, you know, the terpenic uh, content is definitely there, but it's a little more refined and you get that from that maritime influence with this um, lateral valley that just really ch channels the Pacific Ocean straight through it. Um, and I, I just fell in love with this wine and it's... Um, it maintains so much acid too, it's like so crystalline. You exa know? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So very okay. typical but um, also just perfumed and so typical and exotic. Um, and it's important to try and maintain our old vine vineyards Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you don't need old vines to make great wine, but it definitely helps, right? Uh, you have deeper root systems uh, that extract more of the sense of place, that are also more self-sufficient, um, and they learn to produce less but more flavorful grapes over time. Yeah, um, and this producer, Ovum, is very hands-off as well, so they just whole cluster press into uh, large um, mixed, uh, very neutral old barrels and some acacia wood as well. And then they just let the fermentation happen. So wherever it ends, it ends. And as they taste it, they just they just decide when they when they want to put it in bottles. So it's on full leaves, um, all fermented in oak. So you normally wouldn't expect that from a Riesling and Gewurztraminer producer, but this is what Ovum Ovum does. Yeah, and it works. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good. All right, so we'll move uh, uh, north to uh, the Columbia Gorge. Uh, so again, we're along the Columbia River, which uh, provides the natural boundary line between uh, Oregon and Washington. Uh, and this AVA is actually shared, as you see here on the map. So you have a, a, a good chunk of it. Uh, I forget if it's 50-50 or 60-40, but pretty darn close to those um, of you know half being in Oregon and half being in Washington here. Um, so you have uh, a big influence from the Pacific coming up the Columbia River Gorge, right? The river is flowing west towards the Pacific Ocean, um, but it forms this huge channel that acts as a wind tunnel, essentially. And when the inland uh, interior heats up, kind of like, a, you know, the same effect happening in the San Pablo Bay with Napa and all that, 
it acts, uh, the, that the hot air rises and acts as a vacuum, right? And further accentuates that wind that's already coming uh, down the pipeline of the, that Columbia Valley uh, from the Pacific. So it gets very, very cool. It's a very intense place. Um, you have a lot of elevation to deal with and therefore a lot of different uh, climates to deal with and terroirs to deal with. So uh, further west, you're at higher elevations uh, and you're gonna have a little more rainfall. Um, and uh, so it's gonna be a little bit more challenging. In the east, it's a little bit lower elevation. It is drier, it's a little bit warmer. Uh, so I'll show you some stats on that in a minute. But if you have this crazy wind factor going on coming from the west, where do you think you're gonna plant? You're gonna plant on a lot of the easterly slopes, right? To uh, avoid uh, some of that wind to mitigate some of that and to offer some protection, all right? But there's lots of opportunities because of all you're tucked so far into the, uh, the eastern side of the Cascades, there's so much opportunity for um, uh, different aspects to play with. So uh, you can find really cool sites, a bit warmer sites. There's a huge, huge diversity here. And as a result, you're seeing a huge diversity of plantings of varieties. So there's any, you know, some of the Iberian varieties are growing here that are really neat and both cool climate Climate and warmer climate varieties like there's some menthea planted here that's what, what you're, you're gonna taste um, and but you also have some garnacha or garnache planted here too so and some vineyards that are dedicated like the bulk of their production is sparkling wine right so you have all of those things in one ABA it's pretty pretty wild um, it's also in Hood River, one of the uh, sailing sport capitals of the world. So if you like to uh, kite surf or windsurf, this is the place to be. Um, and it's just an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous place. Um, <laughs> gorgeous, <picture>. yeah, <laughs> pun intended. Okay, um, so uh, yeah, as, as far as, as some stats for you here, you can look at the, the temp graph and you really see a big difference, okay? Um, so again, the uh, cooler in the east, warmer in, or sorry, cooler in the west warmer in the east. Um, here's a picture of Ziegler Vineyards. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning here. I forget which side this is on. Can you remind me? Is it Washington or? No, this is on the Oregon, Oregon side. side, right? Yeah. So looking towards, this would be white salmon uh -huh. uh, over here. Um, just incredible, incredible place. Uh, as far as soil types, you have the usual suspects that we already talked about before. So you have uh, the volcanic, the uh, lus, and the, these water deposits from the river, which are obvious. You have this other one called lahar, which is essentially a degraded basalt um, that was created from some heavy rains after freshly uh, deposited basalt that was eroded. Um, but they're you know, all on the, on the uh, basalt volcanic kind of camp for the most part with the addition of these alluvials and uh, a little bit more of a heavy influence of Missoula flood deposits here as well. Okay, uh, so yeah, I mean. What I really love about the Columbia Gorge in addition to all of the different styles of wine and all of the dynamic varieties that are planted there is that it's absolutely stunning for one, but it's also a region that is still very committed to its orchard um, tree fruit mm. plants. And, and so you're, for instance, the Analemma menthea that you have in your glass is planted right next to a cherry and peach orchard. Uh, and the aromatics when you're walking the vineyard and, and smelling the fruit and the flowers, uh, it's just a very natural place to be growing wine and to be making wine that's, you know, organic or biodynamically farmed, which this wine is, and, and fairly um, minimal intervention. They don't add anything. Um, there's a very high uh, whole cluster percentage on this. And this is their first release of Menthea. The 2015 is the first release of Menthea. And I just tasted recently the 16 and 17. And each year they're just getting more and more dialed in. But when I stood in this vineyard, I actually looked, I was standing there in February and I actually looked out and I felt like I was standing in Ribera Sacra with these amazing fir trees and where all the fog and uh, clouds and mist were hanging in the valley it was very Iberian um, in nature to me in, in that cool valley in the winter um, and for me this is a fairly 
classic example of, of menthea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, I mean, you stick your nose in the glass, you're like, whoa, I know what this is. I mean, if you drink those wines, which you should from Rivera Sacra and elsewhere in uh, the northwestern part of Spain, um, you'll see a lot of parallels here. So it's pretty amazing that the gorge has that ability to take a variety out of its homeland, put it there, and have it taste so much like uh, its place of origin. It's pretty creamy. Um, if you watch the, I work for Guildsom, I don't know if we said that earlier, but uh, we have uh, uh, these videos, and we did one on Oregon, and Steve from Analema is, is interviewed, and he's standing in that uh, cherry orchard when the blossoms are all out, and it's just like the most <laughs> epic shot. So it gives you an example, uh, you know, a clear picture of what it's actually like there. And, you know, a lot of or Northern Oregon and Washington in general is dedicated to orchards throughout its uh, agricultural history. So kind of neat. Sure. All right, so next. Next we have two Grenaches, sorry, two Grenaches. <laughs> uh, one from the east, from Walla Walla, and the other from the Applegate Valley in Southern Oregon. So why don't you take taste. us through the Walla Walla? <laughs> yeah, taste those while we run through Walla Walla. Um, so Walla Walla uh, so is, is uh, the most northerly um, uh, AVA. So it's again, just like uh, with the Columbia Gorge, it's shared with, um, with Washington. So it's this is more of the 60-40. I think in Washington we have a little bit uh, bigger bulk of the actually delimited AVA. Um, uh, but there's a good chunk of it in the south and, and probably the most famous part of Walla Walla is actually in Oregon, which is Milton Freewater. All right, so you see it right across the border here. And this is all based on an alluvial fan. Uh, essentially, and it's one of the, uh, not the first AVAs, but one of the few AVAs that is, is, is um, been based solely on its uh, terroir or its soil profile. Okay, so it's, it's composed of, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, it's composed of the, a lot of, a lot of it is composed of the cobbles, uh, or all of it almost is composed of the cobbles as far as Milton free water goes uh, from that alluvial fan. So this area was pioneered by the uh, producer that you're tasting, uh, which is Cayuse. So Christophe Baron is actually Champenoise, he's from Champagne. Uh, he wanted to make wine in the Willamette Valley, actually, and was working a harvest there. Took a drive up to visit a friend in Walla Walla, and um, it drove through this particular old orchard area of, of Walla Walla called Milton Freewater, and uh, and saw these these uh, these galets or these cobbles, and were like, "Oh my God, that looks like." you know, parts of Chateauneuf and the Rhone, like this is amazing. And he got out and started digging around. And if you ever met Christoph, he is a vibrating ball of energy, you know? <laughs> so you can imagine how just like ballistic he went. And um, he totally changed all his plans and relocated to the region and bought an old orchard and started planting and inspired a lot of other people to start planting there. And um, it's become a, uh, a hotbed for both uh, for Oregon but also for Washington too because a lot of Washington wineries source fruit from here. So um, in addition to these classic cobbles in other parts of Walla Walla because you're tucked into the blue uh, mountain range or the blues as they call them um, it's a lot of lust material a lot of Missoula flood material but a lot of lust like lust that's super super deep it's pretty amazing yes. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yep. I'm sorry the one that shows uh, uh, rocks, can you use your pointer? Is it equally distributed between Oregon and Washington? No, that's, uh, that's uh, the Rocks district is this Milton Freewater district here. Yeah, so that's uh, entirely on the Oregon side. Um, but there are great terroirs all tucked up in the blues here. They're more less based and in the same on the Washington side. So the town, the actual, the AVA is named after the actual town of Walla Walla. Uh, so there's uh, Whitman University there. Um, but the big part of the, of the industry is wine and it used to be wheat. Um, and onions, of course. Yeah. Uh, so a, but lot of, a lot of the great vineyards are planted on the Oregon side in the Walla Walla Valley. Yeah. It's just that because the main town is, is Walla Walla on the Washington side, that's where the wineries are located. And because of our ABA regulations, you can't have cross-border ABA yeah. mixes. And so much of the fruit that is produced from Walla Walla wineries is actually grown in Oregon. 
<laughs> yeah. However, I will say that for a while, Oregon didn't want to take Walla Walla under its wing. That's a whole other discussion. We won't get that. Okay. So anyway. But now we have Kristoff. Yeah, but now we have Kristoff, who's a good ambassador. Uh, so just a quick look at the temperature and rainfall. Uh, hardly any rainfall. Okay, this is like minute, minute, minuscule uh, rainfall. Um, higher temperatures, but you have a higher diurnal shift. Okay, um, the biggest thing to watch out for in Walla Walla is frost because of that diurnal shift, and especially in the valleys, and especially where Milton Free Water is, is you have uh, it's at the base of the valley, so you have all this cold air that collects during these huge diurnal shifts, and there's major issues with frost there. So that's what you have to look out for. Otherwise, it's pretty darn easy to grow. Um, they're dealing with it with frost fans and various things. It's a severe, you know, high desert continental climate, so short growing season, very cold winters with winter freeze and frost. Yeah. So that's really the major challenges in this growing region but it makes as you can see very vibrant Grenache yeah. and and other uh, thicker skin varieties. So Christoph is um, not only from Champagne but he also worked a lot uh, in addition to Willana into in the Rhone. Um, huge fan of the Rhone both north and south but actually more in the north uh, and so you see this in his winemaking uh, he employs a lot of cement, he employs a lot of stems, whole cluster, um, and he's a huge proponent of Grenache, even though he's more of a Northern Rhone nerd, but he, he realizes that, uh, that Milton Free Water in particular is really, really conducive to Grenache growing. So he's pioneered a lot of the plantings there. He's doing that really interesting stake train, uh, kind of modified gobelet system, um, and uh, producing these wines all in cement, very, very like, um, you know, not I don't want to use the term natural, non-interventionist, um, but they're they're definitely to me Milton Free Water, especially because of its soil pH and the cobbles and and everything else, it has such a clear imprint uh, of sense of place of terroir, whatever term you want to use, um, on the wine. And man, when you taste these wines, you taste five of these wines, and you realize that that thumbprint. And you're like, and then when you t you you taste it from then on, you even if you're poured blind, you're like, whoa, I know what that is. That's Milton Free Water, and that's pretty incredible for a New World region. Um, that gets yeah, there's a real defined minerality on the palate. Totally, yeah. All right, so here's a, a picture. Uh, this is Stony Vine Vineyard. This is right next to one of Christoph's vineyards. Uh, and so Dusted Valley and, and all other people, they own it, but then they sell some of the fruit to it. So you see that cobble, there's cobbles, right? That alluvial fan, and it's really deep. You have to dig way, 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 way down in order to get to any other kind of soil type. It'll be lush and some uh, Missoula flood material as well. Um, so yeah, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing so place. The Applegate Valley, yeah, Applegate Valley is the next Grenache. So we're back to Southern Oregon again, sitting within the Rogue Valley AVA. The Applegate Valley is a nested AVA within the Rogue Valley AVA. It's quite small. There's only 640 acres planted, and they're all planted on the banks of the Applegate River. So the river here is very important to the creation of the vineyard lands. Most of the vineyard lands here are alluvial uh, soils and uh, mulched granite basically so very free draining but they all have an underlying minerality and there's a variety of uh, varieties grown here so everything from Bordeaux varieties to um, Rhone varieties so uh, Cowhorn with their Syrahs and Rhone blends are a biodynamic producer in this valley and really good really and good. really great wines yeah. uh, and this is actually um, from Minimus, so this is a Willamette Valley producer who purchases fruit from the Applegate Valley and makes it in the Willamette Valley. Um, but what was unique about this vineyard was the very free draining nature of it, uh, completely different soil type uh, to the Willamette Valley. And so Chad Stock, the winemaker there who had worked in, who was from California and has worked in Australia, uh, was intrigued to work with another soil type uh, and different varieties than Pinot Noir uh, and what was available to him in the Willamette Valley. So he uh, works with a very small uh, farmer in the Applegate region. Uh, this vineyard makes only uh, Grenache, Syrah and Savion Blanc and it's quite a stressed vineyard and uh, it gets very warm in, in the vineyard um, but the cool diurnal shift that happens in the afternoon from the shadowing of the Siskiyou mountain range uh, and the cool funneling of, of the um, 
air that happens through this vineyard manages to produce just very elegant, almost Pinot-like Grenache from this um, very granite-heavy soil uh, in, in the Applegate Valley. And this wine is made in a very similar nature to the Cayuse before, and it's 100% whole, whole cluster, um, hand-plunged, and uh, a portion made in concrete as well, and then uh, just aged in, in old oak barrel from malolactic fermentation. And so what I love about the Iberian varieties in, in Oregon is that they do have that uh, elegance to them where the fruit is very prominent, the strawberry red fruit, uh, and very typical of Grenache, but not when you think of Grenache from a typical warm climate. So it's really embodying that um, intermediate climate, that diurnal temperature swing, um, and influence of our mountains and river systems in our vineyards here. Yeah, and the thing with Grenache is it's, it, it's an amazing variety. It produces really beautiful, beautiful wines, but it's one of the most uh, difficult varieties to make into a balanced wine. So you need to uh, incorporate other structural elements into it. Um, it has a hard time uh, maintaining acidity. So uh, with these diurnal shifts or other influences, you really can capture that and start to build a little more structure. Then you can add some stems, build more structure. And that's why it's hard to find varietal Grenache. Usually it's blended, and that's because it's really difficult to make into a really delicious, well-balanced wine. Um, uh, it has thin skins, uh, larger berries, so going back to the nerdy talk about must uh, skin ratios, um, it's harder to build structure in it, but can do it in these climates, which is pretty amazing. So you get some really beautiful, delicious, varietal uh, Grenache wines. Yeah, so you've just tried yeah, bookended Grenaches from the north, yeah, the most the northerly south. and the most southerly <laughs> ABAs in, in yeah. Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and then the final wine in your glass is Tempranillo from the Umpqua Valley. And this is really a special wine. Um, again, this is one of the, you know, one of the most unique wines. Uh, Earl and Hilda Jones came uh, to the Umpqua 21 years ago uh, with the idea that why isn't there any great varietal Tempranillo made in the U.S.? Um, and what they discovered was after doing research in Spain uh, is that Tempranillo needs a relatively short growing season and it needs a large diurnal shift. And so they scoured Oregon to find this uh, special vineyard which is called the Fault Line Vineyard because it sits on a fault line uh, in the Umpqua Valley. So Umpqua has uh, two sub ABAs, Elkton and uh, Douglas Red Hills. And um, this is the beautiful Abacella vineyard. They imported uh, nine different clones of Tempranillo, and this is primarily uh, clone two, and it is fermented uh, in stainless steel and, and small fruit bins, but is then aged in American oak. Um, and it's really what's key in this wine is that huge diurnal shift. There's uh, very long, sunny days in this area. So again, 16 hour days, very sunny, very dry in the short growing season, but extremely high acidity because the diurnal shift here is often 40 degrees. During the day, this area is 95 to 105 degrees and at night it drops down to below 50. So severe diurnal swings that really help to cool down the grapes and uh, balance the profile of the wine here. And this is their Fiesta Tempranillo. Um, it's not their Hoven style, but you could be liken, you, you could liken it to that. It gets about 10 months in American oak, um, so more crianza, but uh, it's, it's very unique and, and a very special vineyard that they've developed and, and sourced the first Tempranillos for. Awesome. I think we need to say diurnal like 20 more times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're talking about Oregon and, and, and Washington since I live there, but uh, it is such an important aspect. So excuse us for you, but All right, so we have we're a little over time, but we have a couple minutes for okay, we're good uh, for some questions. questions? Uh, so maybe we'll uh, I'll pass this one around, and we can, you and I can use that yeah, one. Yeah. Anyone have any questions?
say, you know, I love Spain, and uh, I think that that Mencia is, could be wine tasted for like a concierto or a Vesaka. Yes. Well, logging, logging is uh, is actually the the number one uh, agricultural product in in Oregon or or in the top five at least. So, um, I mean, that's really part of part of the logging companies, and so they they um, you know they cut down trees, log trees, but they replant as well. Uh, what we're actually finding more at the moment is that you know the Willamette Valley and and Oregon wasn't. Well, Willamette Valley wasn't always planted to those beautiful, you know, cedars and dug firs. Uh, it was primarily oak savanna, and so there's been an accord, the White Oak Accord, that um, has recently been committed to, so that um, when people are purchasing vineyard land, they're uh, now if you become part of this oak accord, you're not allowed to cut down any of the old oak savanna that's on the landscape there. And this is something that's really important to Oregonians and especially to the Willamette Valley where they, they really want to restore, um, they don't want it to be a monoculture, they want to have the biodiversity and these oak savannas are actually linking pathways for a whole uh, lot of natural um, butterflies, birds, deer, elk, and so they're almost becoming this pathway through the Willamette Valley, um, which is becoming very important, and I'm really proud to see that initiative that's just you know, taken place in the last year or so, and we have, I think, more than 100 producers signed up for it. Uh, not much was said in regards to like, water and irrigation, uh, and I know that, of course, it's rainier than it is down here, uh, but the summers are quite dry. Uh, how much is being done to like, prevent irrigation as far as like, Oregon constituent, um, you do have quite a bit of water, um, is, it, is, it, is it still like a very low use of irrigation? Just not much to say. Yeah, for the most part, the majority of Oregon is dry grown vineyards, apart from uh, obviously uh, Walla Walla and <coughs> Eastern Washington and Southern Oregon, you do need irrigation in those regions. Um, now in the Willamette Valley, a lot of vineyards are putting in irrigation to establish vines. So it's really only vineyards within the last five years um, to eight years that are um, starting to put in irrigation. I do think it will be a major part of, of planting in, in the Willamette Valley going forward, simply because our summers are becoming hotter and more erratic and our uh, winter rainfall is again more erratic. Um, we hadn't had very much until the spring this year. Um, so we've been replenished. But you know, there was there was a time there where we were thinking, ooh, we're going to be in drought for this and our vines are really going to struggle. So that's the major difference between Burgundy and the Willamette Valley is that dry growing season during the summer. And that's why we have that, you know, definitely more um, fruit forward, riper intensity of style than opposed to Burgundy. Um, from, definitely from that dry growing season, it's, it's really impactful. But it's still, it's still an opportunity to maintain a stable model because there's so much water that falls in the winter. If you just capture that and build an irrigation pool and then capture that and use that, you know, you really don't need a whole lot of water, honestly. Great minds, you know, we talk about this and it is important to talk about, um, but if you compare uh, great growing to many, many other versions of that, Great mind is this much water compared to a lot of other crops. And yeah, I mean, so many things, right? Yeah. So, it, well, it is an issue that's important to talk about, um, especially with the opportunity for capture uh, and also with just, you saw how little was planted compared to the entire area, right? So, a lot of these New York uh, wines are able to, to put those systems in place, make them very efficient. Whereas in Burgundy, you can't really do that. So, like, Burgundy, Burgundy, it's going to be Burgundy forever, right? You can't be like, oh, no. If, if anything, what's becoming more important in, in the Willamette Valley is canopy management. Um, you know, when I, I remember first coming to the Willamette uh, a decade ago and, and then, you know, just five years ago, and um, the, the leaf pulling that happens around uh, Verizon, you know, 
coming into the ripening period and through Verizon uh, was quite dramatic. It was you know, very sparse. And now you're finding the uh, viticulturists are really leaving a lot more leaf cover and doing funneling within the within the uh, vine. So pulling the inner leaves to allow airflow, so there's no disease pressure. Um, but really trying to optimize those eight outer leaves to promote, um, you know, just some more shading so that the fruit isn't getting quite so stressed. But yeah, you know, water water is an issue for vine stress and the vines do shut down. You know, we had 105 degrees in, in September um, and the vines definitely shut down for a long, a long week to 10 days and took that time to get started up again. So uh, last year it was actually beneficial because we got to hang the fruit a little bit longer. Um, but, you know, that's an uncertainty that our viticulturists are, uh, and grow growers are learning to deal with year by year. So it's a very changing climate. Um, and I think Oregon always has been, and the Willamette Valley always has been. Yeah, can you imagine a huge thing, of course, with the Willamette Valley, but a lot of other things too, a lot of investments and understanding that how to improve the thing you mentioned. See, there's a lot of issues. Yeah, there's a question down the front. Uh, no, Pinot Noir is still 90%, but there is some conversation happening at the moment that uh, it might be raised to 100% for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay among growers. Um, I think it's always a conversation that's happening, but to be honest, there's nothing else planted. You know, it's only, <laughs> it's kind of been a non-issue until now when we're starting to get some Gamay and Trousseau Noir and, and things like that planted. I'm going to start a Grand campaign. <laughs> 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 I, I actually did. Um, in terms of the, uh, we were talking about the logging industry in Oregon. It, it probably fuels most of the American oak barrels that Australia and Spain sees. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So yeah. most of the American oak barrels comes from this region, and so that's the, one of the big reasons why they don't want, you know, it to kind of pull back. But there's also you mentioned um, if there's cherry orchards and, and peach orchards and um, what else was there? Uh, there's hazelnuts, hazelnuts and grass and all that and, yeah. kind of things that have a unique aspect to the to the mm -hmm. so It's just more that it's more diverse in its, um, I guess, biodiversity. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, for me, that's something. You know, coming from Australia, you know, we have we have bush and we have vineyards. That's you know, or we have wheat fields way out. But there, you know, that's really what's so special about Oregon. And and I love the initiatives that are happening about maintaining the oak savannas and and really being mindful of protecting this very special growing region and not letting it change as we get more investment from uh, France and California. I think there's nearly ten French producers now in the Willamette Valley and um, you know all of that attention is increasing there's still you know a fair amount of plantable land to be had um, but the fact that there are producers that that having orchards and having you know uh, dairy farms and grass and hazelnuts and and forest and protecting those oak savannas is really important to to what makes Oregon wine Oregon wine. Any other questions? Just a little bit of mist in the discussion on wine four. Did you guys talk about that? Wine four was the Irvine and Roberts Pinot Noir from Southern Oregon. So that's the um, from the Rogue Valley that was planted on the sandstone and uh, and clay soils. And it's triple seven and one one five primarily. Uh, it was harvested in mid September and uh, is all destemmed. Uh, it is uh, an inoculated ferment, which is um, I think wine two is the only other one that is as well. And uh, just a very traditional uh, handling of Pinot Noir, but being from that Rogue Valley area, um, being a much drier region, they do require um, irrigation down there, a uh, much drier area, and it's more about uh, the, picking, the picking window of 
that balance between uh, fruit ripeness and acidity and uh, you know flavor profile not getting too ripe um, but also we do get frosts down in that area as well so you can push it a little bit longer but getting into the fall down there you're you know you're tempting fate with frost and, and the snow coming in that area all right I thank you so much for your attention Please go taste a ton of amazing wines upstairs. We'll also be doing some There's breakout tastings. There's some pop-ups, yeah, breakout, yeah. pop-up pop -up tastings. Breakout tastings. So <laughs> the one that's up next is uh, tasting like an MS and MMW, how we get to how yeah. we get to what's in the glass in Oregon wine. Well, that's so. at 2.30. Actually, we have Pinot Gris at 1.30. Oh, sorry, yeah. Pinot Gris at 1.30. And then uh, sparkling wine at 3.30. Uh, 3.30, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's upstairs in the taste, main tasting area. <laughs>